Uh, somebody's recording, right? Yes, I am yeah, also I recording. I think Chun is also recording on his end. Yes, I'm cloud recording. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so, well, good evening, afternoon, morning, everyone. Welcome to Crypto Tonight, episode six. Uh, my name is Yama, and it's my great pleasure to be your host again tonight. So before we start, I just want to say, I just want to say thank you, Pulling Mining, for this, uh, uh, sponsoring this office. Uh, however, the network is not really working very well. But anyway, uh, Kevin was just planning to join us, but he couldn't really make it as he's traveling today and still trying to deliver water. Uh, however, we still got something pulling here and uh, something also Bitcoin there. Uh, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, Bitcoin origin, own new stories, and its future. So to start with, please join me welcoming our four fantastic guests of tonight, tech geeks and financial geeks. First brief introduction, could you please share a bit about your background and how did you first hear about Bitcoin and what were like your initial thoughts. Um, start with Adam, the co-founder and CEO of Blockstream. Yeah, so the I was interested in electronic cash for a long time, since uh, mid-90s. And uh, so the first thing I heard about Bitcoin was an email from Satoshi Nakamoto in fall of 2008. And um, you received an email I <laughs> Yeah, so I, th I think it's the first email that anybody received. Like a number of people sent Gwen their emails and he put them on a blog post. So it looks like it was the first email. Now, of course, I didn't realize that this was uh, a pseudonym. I thought it was uh, a real name. Um, and Maybe this so is he, a real name. <laughs> maybe, maybe it is, yeah. So, <laughs> so I sent him, he was asking about the... Uh, citation for Hashcash, so I sent him that and also sent him some information about B-Money, which is a related electronic cash system using mining that was discussed. I mean, it's just a design. It wasn't implemented. In, uh, and that was from 1998, the year after Hashcash. So there was a long-running discussion about how to deploy electronic cash. And from the 1997 Hashcash, the conversation changed a bit to using mining to do that because it was a way, as Wei Dai put it, to uh, have electronic cash system without a banking interface because relying on banks would be difficult. Mm -hmm. And it was also, people were thinking about doing it, how to do it in a decentralized way because the previous electronic cash system that people were very interested in, which was DigiCash, had a centralized double spend database and the uh, DigiCash, the company, uh, went bankrupt, and so anybody who had DigiCash coins, and I had a few, they disappeared. Like you had the coins, but nobody could tell if they were valid because you couldn't reach the double spend database to check. So that sort of central point of failure, single point of failure, um, informed people's thinking. So then they were looking at, you know, B Money, for example, was talking about broadcasting transactions and Nick Sabo's. Bitgold was talking about Byzantine Generals protocol, but they're both just designs that didn't get implemented. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the thing that later got implemented was uh, Hal Finney's RPAL, reusable proof of work, that got implemented in by Hal Finney in 2004, but it's still uh, centralized. So the decentralized ones didn't get implemented. Mm -hmm. There were design issues, so things that people didn't quite know how to fix that Satoshi fixed. So I think that's, you know, that's one of the innovations is finding a way to make it fully decentralized where B-Money and Bitgold had some partially sort of federated or human involvement parts of the design. Mm -hmm. So I know you are the creator of the Hashcash and in 97 uh, you came up with this Hashcash idea and which was also cited in the Bitcoin white paper. I guess like people uh, already all knew Adam, so since you are the closest point that we can get to Satoshi, should we just go directly and ask you, how are you feeling Satoshi today? Or should we ask, how's the weather today in Malta? Which question do you prefer, Adam? What, what, what was the first question? How? how? How are you feeling Satoshi today? Oh, okay, no, so I'm <laughs> not Satoshi. The and, uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, a lot of people have an interest to speculate and find Satoshi, but I think Satoshi is uh, presumably left and not mm -hmm. coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think people tend to sort of, in trying to find Satoshi, they, they do Google searches and look for things they think 
uh, would be related. And so then they, they have a kind of uh, selection bias. You know, it's like look at, if you're looking for the author of a book and it's published by a pseudonym, then you do a search for book authors and then people say, well, look, these book authors can write. So, yeah, I can, I can write C++, but so can, you know, one million other people. Now, of course, I was interested in electronic cash, but that's what people were searching for, right? Mm-hmm. There's like people who are interested in electronic cash, so it's not surprising. And, yeah. you know, they also suspect like Hal Finney and Nick Sabo and Wei Dai and a bunch of other people. So there's like a lot of coincidences, plus looking for people with relevant skill sets and interests. Thank you, Adam. So probably we can talk about the weather in Malta instead. Um, at least we know weather is very, maybe too English topic for conversation. <laughs> anyway. Well, it's, it's pretty warm outside. Um, very <laughs> nice. sunny. It's, uh, apparently vitamin D is good for the immune system mm-hmm. and uh, being able to, you know, to help fighting <laughs> off covid I guess if you get sick. The weather in Malta helps. Uh, Satoshi has also a better mood. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Uh, uh, next, uh, moving on to Beto, my dear friend from Argentina. Hello. Uh, well, uh, my story with Bitcoin is uh, much less impressive, I think, than Adam's. <laughs> I, I, I had a friend uh, from school and we were working on different projects was uh, 1998. So the, there was a reward program uh, business. Uh, he was designing and I was helping some technical sites. And he came up with the name of uh, Bitcoins, bitcoins.com, mm-hmm. which was the domain he registered. Uh, but we couldn't go around. We were really young. We were like 16, 17, uh, when we started doing all these things. And uh, at that point, we were 20, 20, yeah, 21, I think, or 20. So we couldn't get it really going. And um, well, time passed. And it was 2011. And he called me at night and asked me, Beto, uh, you know, I need to sell the domain. And I, uh, he was buying a house, and I really need the money. And uh, but I, I have an offer. But I heard that something going on with uh, Bitcoin, something. Why don't you check it? So I started researching, and I was blown away uh, because one of my first jobs was uh, a forex trader. So w- when I came into all, all of this. It just made a lot of sense for me. And I just called him like three hours later and told him, don't sell. (laughs) Don't sell it, please. Uh, I think this is so huge. And, um, well, then I started working on, because in Argentina we have a lot of problems, Mm. economic problems. And I thought, why not we start integrating Bitcoin, uh, you know, into companies they will need it to be safer than they are with the local economic situation. And I started working uh, also trying to do uh, an integration with, I was uh, teaching SAP uh, at the university. So I started trying to do a co-innovation program with SAP, uh, trying to put Bitcoin into it. And uh, at that time, uh, my friend did the first conference in Argentina for Bitcoins. And um, there I met uh, Tony Galippi, which is the founder and CEO, oh, was the, the founder and CEO of BitPay. Mm-hmm. And um, I started telling him all the things I, I understood that would be interesting because they had the first payment uh, processor for Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And I thought it would be really interesting into integrating it into companies. So the next day he told me, why don't you come work for us? I said, okay. And uh, from then on, I I started uh, applying all the the use cases I thought would be interesting. And here I am. That's the history. 
Nice. I mean, besides Bitcoins.com and BitPay, uh, I met Beto last year in Buenos Aires and quickly became good friends. Beto, you're more Chinese than anyone that I know in my life. I really appreciate the way how you value our Huaxia culture, Huaxia Wenming. It's not just in your ideas, but also in your blood, in your daily life. And by the way, Beto is also a, a pro in the Kung Fu, Zhan Zhuang, and Yi Quan. And you know, one of the most popular exercise today in China is actually to pay fifty dollars per hour to learn how to stand still properly, which is called Zhan Zhuang. <laughs> I couldn't really understand it until I met Beto. <laughs> and, and Beto even. Lost Chinese culture so much that uh, you named your daughter Sophia May. And um, May is a Chinese word meaning beautiful, and I'm so sure she will grow up not just being beautiful but also intelligent. Thank you, Beto. So happy to finally have you here. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. So next, uh, Chun, the co-founder of F2Pool. Hi, Chun. Hi, Beto. Hi, Beto. Can you hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so happy to be here again, Crypto tonight with Yama. Thank you. And uh, for me, first read about uh, Bitcoin as slash dot in 2011, because I was quite busy working on my personal projects, uh, some Apple Store apps. And Searching aliens, no? So, yeah, so <laughs> yes, uh, missed the opportunity to get to know Bitcoin earlier. So after I finished my earlier projects, uh, and uh, you know, uh, start to check uh, slashed out regularly again, and uh, I found Bitcoin. People talking about something called Bitcoin. I didn't know. Uh, I, I know nothing about the economy back then, so I skipped the first few articles I read about that. And until I see uh, more and more often uh, people mention Bitcoin as slashed out, I go to. Uh, Bitcoin Wiki and uh, to check out how it works, what is it, and uh, suddenly get to know, uh, how, um, get uh, understanding like uh, what Bitcoin, how, how that's work, what is the proof work. So I immediately, second second day, uh, went to local market, got uh, two pieces of GPUs and uh, start my Bitcoin. And uh, because I was also contributing to a project called SETI at Home, so I immediately convert uh, my existing city at home operations into Bitcoin my operations. Bitcoin. Uh, city at home is uh, is total free contribution, but Bitcoin, uh, you, you you can actually get something back and uh, get something uh, worth something. And uh, so that's uh, I, I was one of the few original Bitcoiners uh, in mm -hmm. China. So. I remember back in 2011, the first time I, I went to Bitcoin forum, I see a sub forum called uh, Chinese Student. I, I, I had no idea why this forum is there. Mm. So, uh, actually, if you today you go to Bitcoin Talk, you, you can still find that forum uh, mm. camp. And uh, also, uh, uh, after uh, one or two months into uh, mining, uh, try different mining tools. Uh, I stick with uh, DeepBit for an extended time and uh, created a team called China Team. And among the team members, uh, some some quite famous Bitcoiners like NG Zhang, who later created the first uh, ASIC, uh, some team members of, uh, of, my, of my team. And uh, uh, I I only mined Bitcoin from 2011 to 2013 because uh, my mm, GPU farm is uh, quite, uh, except uh, the GPU itself uh, is worth something and uh, all the, uh, any other things like mainboard, memory, RAM, and uh, USB stick, I use USB stick, so everything together is uh, only worth like $30. Uh, second hand, so I cannot switch the menu from to other coins like Litecoin because mm -hmm. it doesn't have enough grade. And when the ASIC introduced, and uh, I have no choice but to shut everything down. Mm -hmm. And so my Bitcoin miner life ended uh, seven years ago. Okay. Uh, being <laughs> operating mining pool is very different, like uh, uh, mining Bitcoin on your own. So um, I, I don't see myself a Bitcoin miner anymore. So mm. uh, yeah, from later story, I think many people already know that. Mm. Like I have to do uh, 
uh, started in 2013, and uh, uh, we, we had uh, Slash at first, and then Deep Beat, once Deep, Deep Beat got uh, almost uh, 40% of the uh, network hash rate, and then uh, GHash IO, and we replaced uh, GHash IO in 2014, became the world's uh, largest uh, uh, Bitcoin mining pool. And uh, uh, Antru still uh, wasn't even born. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm so happy, like, after so many years, we, we replaced pooling and uh, become uh, number one again. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, so, yeah, if you look back into the history, we, at some moment, we, I, I even feel that I can, we cannot continue, we, can, we cannot uh, uh, stay, you know, uh, but... But uh, you're still here today. I, I market, still remember other mining tools like BW and, uh, and also Bitmain, and, uh, you know, if you check it again, suddenly you feel that all those strong competitors just suddenly disappear, you know. <laughs> yeah. still hopefully have, we can stay. But we still have yeah. a few years Yeah, hopefully we can stay there. for yes. an extended time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Chen is a really a uh, trouble man, and, uh, but it's also a real mm. gig. Um, slash dot, set to the home, and different influenced by Wikipedia, new, neutral point of view. And I know neutrality and decentralization forms the way how Chun you see the world today. And really thank you for being with us here again. And really appreciate that you made for the show. I know uh, because you are traveling these days. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving on next to uh, our old friend, the CEO, the CEO of the Arrows Capital. Yes. Uh, well, for me, the the history is not as um, not as technical or pure, I guess, but um, more sort of as a trader and, and as a as speculator. I think for me, it would have been late 2012, early 13. Um, at that time, I had just quit my job at a investment bank, and uh, my partner and I were starting three hours at a time uh, to trade actually a high frequency foreign exchange. So totally separate from Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a break in between. So we started in San Francisco and we were going to move to Singapore, uh, which we ended up doing. And we had a break of about maybe six months where we had to set things up. So the, the first trader that we hired was a guy named uh, Joey Ergo, who later went to Coinbase. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, basically we had been uh, looking at ways to move money into Macau because we were playing poker at that time to, to at the time. And uh, you know, it started watching the price as well at that time because we had learned that apparently the best way to get money in was through Bitcoin already, even though the price was, it was, the liquidity is not very good, but it was already being used in that way. And uh, I found that really fascinating. Um, and um, later on, you know, he, he told me, you know, if, if, I, if I ever make a lot of money, I'm going to go 100%, you know, denominate in Bitcoin. And I thought he was crazy at that time. I thought, like, you know, this is an experiment. I hadn't, at that time, I don't think I had downloaded a wallet. I don't think I really read too much about it. I was just watching the number. Uh, and watching where it traded. Um, at that point, I started to, maybe two or three months later, I started to see that there was like structural arbitrage in the market where you could buy it on Bitstamp and sell it in BBC China and make like 10, 15%. Because mm -hmm. back then, um, there was a lot of demand in China and people were using it to move money around as well. So, so yeah. that kind of really interested me because, you know, as a foreign exchange trader, I thought, you know, the world actually does need a sort of decentralized money, right? A money that's uh, not tied to a state and sort of usable by people as a last resort, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, from there, my, my you know my interest sort of grew more philosophically around Bitcoin as well, and uh, seeing it as investment as well as seeing it as a long term kind of uh, industry. Mm -hmm. But but back then, because we were you know in the investment banks, trading foreign exchange and, and all these things, um, you know, we had, we had a lot of counterparties who. No, we were actually scared to talk about Bitcoin then because the the connotation when we were in Singapore, you talked about Bitcoin, was that uh, you know there would be AML flags that would actually get raised on you, mm -hmm. um, and and so you know we never really saw a way to do it institutionally at that time. Uh, later on, we we began to set up a subsidiary to trade crypto, um, and now we've rolled that actually back into our main fund, which uh, is kind of nice to see because. You know, in a way, it shows how far we've come as an industry, right? Where you know, just a few years ago, it was a very dirty word. And now, you know, you have Goldman Sachs saying that they're going 
do a conference call to, to educate their investors on Bitcoin and gold. And so it's, it's been fascinating to see. Um, I think that for me, um, the, like the really surprising thing, I guess, is how um, even though it, it's so subversive in some ways to a lot of things, its growth has been unstoppable in a lot of ways, right? That's been the biggest surprise for me. I continue to be surprised each day. So, Sue, uh, so do you trade Bitcoin, but do you also loan Bitcoin? Because you know, like, for example, Chun, he doesn't trade any Bitcoin, he doesn't trade. And you, like, trade Bitcoin all the time. Do you also loan it? Do I also loan, loan Bitcoin? You mean borrow? Yeah. Yeah, so, so we're one of the largest counterparties to some of the big uh, borrow lending desks mm -hmm. uh, for doing various arbitrage trading strategies. I think for us, because we had the strength of our traditional hedge fund balance sheet and track record, you know, we have seven years of audit. We have, you know, we're very well known in the FX space. So mm -hmm. that kind of helped us, I guess, um, you know, show that we were very serious. I mean, there's a number of players that have come from the traditional side. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've got like Jump Trading, Tower Research, quite a few of these firms. And I think that, you know, like in a way, it's, it's very cool because, um, you know, up until now, you have the investment bank sitting between the end clients mm -hmm. and the user, the consumer, right? And there is like, you know, there's a sales guy there, a structure, or like another sales guy maybe, and then a trader who doesn't really do that much. And they all are making a spread, right, each time. And, and so all, for a lot of trading firms, it's very interesting because now you have the chance to sit, you know, very, very close to the consumer, very close to the end client, mm -hmm. and facilitate his trade or her trade, and with very few middlemen, actually. And, and so like that, that's, I think, why a lot of trading firms have come, as the volumes have grown, um, those opportunities now are, are basically are more easily captured by more nimble, smaller firms um, who have low head counts, who have you know understand this industry. That's good. Uh, thank you, Sue. And also, I want to mention uh, a good news for you as well because you know last time when you were on the show, I had only fifty Twitter followers, and thanks to you pinning the episode three to your Twitter uh, today, I have like I think I got three hundred followers. Um, kind of like a milestone. Yes. Thanks to you. Thank you. Now, um, moving on to our opening question. Um, what's Bitcoin? If you were to answer J.K. Rowling's tweet, I do not understand Bitcoin, please explain it to me. How would you answer it from your perspective? Is there any quick and digestible way to improve people's Bitcoin knowledge? Uh, maybe start with Adam. Hi, Adam. I did actually respond to it, but it's going to take <laughs> me a while to find it. Uh... Let me see. Finding your tweet? I, I, I can remember what it said. It, ju it just said something like, you know, because I wasn't obviously going to say anything technical, uh -huh. but I just said that, you know, technology changes over time, and that when gold was first used for money, mm. it probably seemed strange to people at the time, mm -hmm. right? So in a online world, you would expect a technology to evolve to have uh, more online money, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's kind of like, just like online money, uh, if you would like to explain it to, to people who doesn't really know anything about Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Um, how about you, Beto? Oh, um, well, method. I see it more... <laughs> I, I I will explain it from uh, the infrastructure side. It's like the internet changed uh, the way, for example, we communicate uh, over the phone. And at first, when BoIP came, uh, um, the communication company said, no, no, we won't use that technology. No, it changes everything for us and we don't want it. And now every... Uh, communications company uses BoIP as an infrastructure uh, for anything they do because it's cheaper, it's faster. Mm. So I think that the same goes uh, for, for example, uh, payments and the value proposition Bitcoin uh, integrates. Mm. And it's just that, that maybe you won't know in the future that you're using actually Bitcoin mm. you know, and, and the technology but you will be using it because it's cheaper and faster. Hmm, okay. And how about you, Chen? Mm, I, I knew Harry Potter, but uh, 
I didn't know who wrote it until okay. last week you told me. <laughs> okay. So I don't know. Maybe I'll say the same thing Adam said, and maybe I'll just add like that's a Bitcoin, and if you don't believe it, you don't get it. I don't have time trying to convince you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote, Satoshi quote, yeah. I found one tweet, so there was another topic on this thread, because this thread lasted for a day or so, uh, yes. and people had fun with it. And so there were a lot of fake uh, JK Rowlings, too. Yeah. And uh, Brian Armstrong, well, one of them said, okay, okay, I give up, I bought some Bitcoin. But it was a fake JK Rowling. And Brian Armstrong from Coinbase responded to it, and encourage the fake JK Rowling to deposit their Bitcoin on Coinbase and buy some shit coins. <laughs> and so I responded to that uh, to say, oh, don't do that. You're going to get, you know, that's, you'll get wrecked, you'll lose money. That's a bad idea. Anyway, so somebody, I posted in the uh, chat, uh, mm -hmm. somebody made a drawing of this exchange, uh, like a, a pencil drawing. Um, and I think the person who posted it actually got their account temporarily suspended. It's one of the meme people. Uh, anyway, it was funny. Um, there were other things like that. <laughs> Interesting. And, and also, I feel the traditional power is so strong, you know. Uh, in the past, uh, people were trying to convince the sincerity and most of the other people, like, the sun is in the middle, of, uh, in the center of the universe, not the Earth. But uh, you know what happened before. And uh, only history could uh, could correct this, could could tell the truth. So it, the result of convince people mm. really not going uh, going well. Some people like uh, been burned by you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But history will will, will tell the truth. Yes. After a few hundred years, we'll see that. Uh, it maybe not hundred. Let's hope uh, just ten years. Real <laughs> Thank you, Chin. And how about you, Sue? As someone who yeah, wants for the financial I background. think the digital scarcity, I think the concept of digital scarcity is really starting to catch on uh, among traditional investors as, as well as just mainstream, right? Because, you know, first of all, I think the generational is speaking. You know, people are used to things on the internet being worth as much or more than things that are in real life, right? So, um, secondly, I think, you know, uh, it's Having been around more than ten years now, no one ever asked like, "When is Bitcoin gonna have a chain death? When is it gonna all disappear?" Now they're just saying, "Okay, what's the right price for it? Should I buy it now or should I wait?" Or you know, is it? So, so I think that kind of Lindy effect uh, has gotten us to the point now where you know people now do view it as a form of scarcity that exists. And I think that you know, for at least you know, me for me sitting here in Singapore and speaking to some high net worth individuals here. You know, they don't know where to put money now because, you know, they used to think about property, but now with this you know, COVID situation, they're wondering, okay, maybe I can't even access my property for three years because, you know, the situation changed. I can't get a visa to even enter that country where my property is. Maybe I don't even, I can't even sell it or I have an exit tax. Um, so people are really starting to question whether real estate is a store of value. And I think, especially for Chinese investors, I just saw another very interesting article where it said, Chinese investors are expected to net sell from Canada and Australia in the next five years, right? And that's like a reversal of a seven-year trend, 10-year trend even, where they've been piling the money in and saying, okay, I buy my Vancouver condo, I buy my Melbourne, Sydney condo, and that's my money, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, it's always going to be there and it's always going to be safe, sort of value. Now people are wondering like, okay, that, that, that whole narrative is kind of broken down. Right? And with gold now as well, you know, with the difficulties of accessing it, with the difficulties of coming in and buying it, um, people are now saying, okay, um, what what remains, right? Um, and I think that that's what's gotten a lot of the interest from the macro hedge fund community into Bitcoin recently. There's huge CME open interest, and, you know, huge volumes in GBTC as well. I think um, people are absolutely converging on Bitcoin as a sort of scarcity play. And so I would explain it first and foremost as you know, 21 million supply, um, it's uh, it has the strongest social consensus. It has the strongest consensus that it will keep this gap, and it will be able to it will be able to defend your rights to scarcity. Mm -hmm. So, to me, I think the whole Bitcoin system is like a global distributed bank. 
uh, with a transparent public traceable and immutable ledger and it's open to anyone and no one controls it and this bank issues only one currency called Bitcoin limited max 21 million supply as you mentioned as well and no inflation issue and this Bitcoin bank currency Bitcoin is also kind of like this bank's stock uh, this is my understanding for like a non geek perspective <laughs> I don't know if it's like makes sense to people or not, but it's how I understand it. Yeah. So uh, thank you. So uh, I know you all have been in the crypto space since the very early days, like 2000, um, 2009, 2011, 2013. What are your most memorable um, uh, moments and days in the Bitcoin history? Uh, maybe start with Beto, friend of Mr. Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think that there are a few, um, but. One of the funniest I, I recall is when we went to the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, uh, the football uh, World Cup, and we did this uh, gig to do donations uh, through Bitcoin, uh, showing the QR code, because one guy uh, in the US uh, started uh, this, um, showing a QR code during a... a American football game, saying, uh, showing the, this big uh, um, card, saying, "Hey, mom, send me some Bitcoin," and showing our QR code or uh, something like that. And uh, we took that idea and uh, created uh, this donation cup to uh, have Mr. Bitcoin, which is like a, a mascot, so, uh, a way to. Because at that time, people think of Bitcoin like Bitcoin is for drugs, uh, Bitcoin is bad, blah, blah, blah. So we wanted to do something that was enticing even for kids and for people to, to see the good side of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started this donation cup and going around with Mr. Bitcoin uh, through the different parts of the World Cup and showing these QR codes and asking people to donate to uh, to, for the kids mm -hmm. and it was great because we, we got some donations and with that we went uh, with the kids and, and did some good stuff and uh, that showed that Bitcoin could be used from anywhere in the world mm -hmm. to send money uh, for good causes so I think that that was one of the most funny things we did that's very nice. And you know, I was actually watching an online video with, uh, for Adam's interview last year in the La Bitcoin. And when Adam was doing the interview, and actually the Mr. Bitcoin was actually walking around behind Adam. <laughs> and uh, Adam and the host was like, uh, how's it chatting? And Mr. Bitcoin was trying to talk, you know, to approach uh, and Adam. And, but then I think we, Mr. Bitcoin was kind of like hesitating, like, okay, maybe they're doing the interview. I should interrupt. And then he turned around. <laughs> and that was very funny in the video. I think Adam... Uh, Probably wish, uh, I should send the link to you, Adam. And how about you, Adam? Uh, what's your memorable um, moments and days in the Bitcoin history? Oh, I mean, there's so many. The, uh, the you level received of the email from Satoshi. And, and uh, memes and so on. It's uh, it's like a soap opera. keeps you keeps you amused endlessly. Um, mm. but I think you know one of the most interesting and positive outcome things I saw was the the fork drama and the resolution to it uh, like the UASF movement mm. and you know the users coming together and deciding that they were gonna take a position mm. because it showed that Bitcoin is hard to change mm. and you know, that was in like fall of 2017 and after the uh, fork drama was resolved, the price shot up to you know four or five times within those few months to twenty thousand dollars. And I think before that, for you know, presumably a year or however long that fork drama was going on mm -hmm. at, at its height, people were uncertain. You know, so I think it was depressing confidence and therefore the price. And the fact that the uh, resolved in the way it did, like that basically the market run, the activist investors uh, forced the, the price of uh, you know the fork futures, like the Segwit 2x future, mm -hmm. down to 10 percent, and you know other forks even lower since. Was um, it was very interesting. It was uncertain for a lot of people what was going to happen, and people took risks, but 
the fact that that was resolved, I think that made Bitcoin a lot stronger because people didn't know exactly what was going to happen mm -hmm. and how Bitcoin would survive future financial pressures from big businesses. And basically at that point, you know, the maximum amount of uh, business influence was was tried to be organized and applied to the Segwit 2x fork. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin, like Bitcoin users basically, and market participants with their trades, um, emphatically won. And that, that became part of uh, Bitcoin's kind of um, immutability and gold-like guarantee. I think if, if Bitcoin had been changeable to any any business interest, it doesn't matter which business interest, but if, it, if it's changeable influence, that would be uh, less plausible as, as being digital gold. You, know, you can't argue with a gold brick and say, well, I want that to be more, or I want to mix it with copper or something. It just that doesn't work that way, right? So the fact that the uh, game theory and the economics and the market meant that Bitcoin was actually much more robust than people expected was a very positive thing. Of course, it was also profitable if you sold the right things at the right time. So I had a lot of fun trading as well during that time. Nice. I think what happened in Bitcoin just made Bitcoin stronger today, as we can see. And since you mentioned price, and Sue is actually dealing with the Bitcoin price every day because you trade on Bitcoin. And how about you, Sue? What's your memorable uh, moments about in the Bitcoin? It's, for me, it's, it's more of a person. It's more of a personal story. But I guess in fall of 2013, I, I was pretty active in the Bitstamp versus BTC China ARB, and I had a very large uh, batch that was that I had sent fiat to Bitstamp to buy BTC and then sent to BTC China. I had happened to I was I had to be on a flight basically that day mm -hmm. uh, with my then girlfriend of two months, who later became my wife. And uh, it was actually going to intro uh, her to my family and to my parents as well in Beijing mm. at that time. So um, my parents had put us a place to stay in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And when I checked in, I needed to like send the coins and like make sure that I start selling to the people that I needed to and this kind of things. And I found that there was no internet, uh, very, very bad internet in our uh, hotel. And at, at that time, uh, for whatever reason, like people didn't, like 4G wasn't really a thing yet. It was 3G, and it wasn't good. It was super expensive, and you know. So, so I, so I, I told my girlfriend like, we, we have to check out. Like, we can't stay here. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And she thought I was absolutely insane because my mom had booked this uh, place for, yeah. for us to stay, right? And I said, no, let's just get in a cab, and uh, we'll ask for the best five star hotel in the, in the area. So we, so we uh, got in a cab. And then the Intercon in Beijing was right next to it. Uh, so we stayed at the Intercontinental. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we were there at maybe midnight. And they quoted me, like, a really high price. And I said, fine, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, like, everyone was mad at me the next day because I was like, you know, they, they thought I was showing off, actually. They thought that the whole thing was like, I was, like, showing off to her. When, it, when actually I, I really wanted to just get internet to Better finish the transaction done. Uh, and, and then I found out the next day that I had like left like my watch, which was expensive back at the previous place. And like, they had to go through like two hours of house cleaners, but they found it eventually. So that to me is very memorable because it was just like, you know, thinking back now, like, like I viewed Bitcoin price risk as far riskier than sort of transactional risk. And mm -hmm. sort of knowing what I know now, I find price risk to be a lot less than transactional risk. So, so that kind of is an interesting play where... You know, I wouldn't have wanted to hold a very large amount for for a transaction uh, for fear of the price moving. But, but nowadays, uh, with the way that Bitcoin has developed, it's, it's become it's changed my it's changed my perception of risk mm -hmm. as well. Very interesting uh, perspective uh, transaction. And since you mentioned transaction, actually, Chun Mining Pool is actually trying to make sure all the network transactions are safe. And how about you, Chun? What's your memorable uh, uh. moments in Bitcoin? Uh, I think one of the memorable moments, uh, maybe when uh, Bitcoin price hit uh, one cent on Mt. Gox. And I just finished my Python script because um, Mt. Gox back in 2011 to 2011 are quite uh, primitive. And uh, they, they didn't have uh, you know, an order book that can be seen on, on the user interface. So uh, I, I just finished a Python script to uh, fetch from their API and uh, 
to regularly update. Back then, there, there was no uh, web socket. We regularly update every few seconds uh, for their other book. And uh, on that day, I suddenly launched my script and uh, checked it out. I see it's, it's the price like going down slowly, slowly. It's very slow. It took like uh, more than one hour until the price uh, finally hit uh, 0 0.01. And uh, I, I I couldn't tell what happened. Serious. Only a second second morning, I, I checked it. He confirmed like uh, it was it got hacked. And uh, yes, yeah, quite 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 interesting appearance. <laughs> okay. Luckily, we don't have to see that uh, anymore. One cent. That's really scary. <laughs> so uh, thank you, guys. Uh, so next, maybe moving on to our next session um, called "You Ask Me," and <coughs> Sue knows this is my favorite format. Not just because I'm being a lazy host. <laughs> and so first, Chen, uh, I know you have some questions for Adam. And Adam, be ready. Uh, there might be too many questions for you tonight. But Chen, start your question first. Yeah, for me, right? Mm. Uh, I think. I think for blockstream, what I am interested in the most is the satellite project. I don't know, like, uh, uh, what was the goal of this project? And how to see the project uh, going after five years? Uh, and because, you know, this satellite, uh, if I understand correctly, it's owned by blockstream, the company. And uh, if uh, launching satellites, uh, the, the goal is like how to aid the decentralization of the network. But the satellite is actually owned by a company, so it probably won't help the decentralization. And also other companies like, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, so actually we don't own the satellites because they're really expensive to launch. So what we've done is leased bandwidth on four satellites and six coverage zones. So we tried to select different satellite companies or different ownership of the satellites so that you know, there's no one company that could interrupt service. In, in many places, there are two satellites covering the same area or overlapping areas. Um, I think the centralization question is really interesting. So when it was first launched, Andreas Antonopoulos asked a question, a similar kind of question, which is, well, okay, but now do you have to trust Blockstream? Because Blockstream can, I mean, the satellites are actually, uh, they don't have much intelligence. They send back the data that you send up to them. So most of the intelligence is actually on the ground in the in the uplink site. And the uplink sites are owned and operated by Blockstream. So his, his question was, well, now do I have to trust Blockstream? Is that better, right? And I think the answer is actually that because the data stream is um, self-authenticated, you know, because you can look at the proof of work and you can cross-check it, then you end up not having to trust Blockstream. It's kind of like you have a peer-to-peer -peer node and it has on average eight connections. And let's say one of the connections is much faster. So you end up getting all your data from it, but you're still cross-check you know, headers from another slower link. And so if you have the satellite connection, it, the, the software allows you to have multiple, you know, to have priority on the satellite connection as your internet connection, but still have, let's say, a another slower connection, like a 2G tether or something like that, then you can check that the that you're on the longest chain. And so if if the satellite sent you some wrong information, you could detect it kind of thing. Of course, if you only have the satellite, now, now you're trusting. But, you know, it there is proof of work on it. So if the information was wrong, uh, the proof of work would slow down or it, it would be false and you could detect that, right? Um, so the other thing, I mean, recently, like last month, we increased the bandwidth a lot. So before we had um, about 300 megahertz spectrum, and now we have 1.2, um, sorry, 300 kilohertz. Now we have 1.2 megahertz. And the due to lots of optimizations, we were able to get up to uh, 25 times as much data through it. So we've turned on capability to synchronize the full history. So if you, if you connect it, connect it to a full node and wait about 20 days, it will actually fill in the entire history, even if you have no internet connection. Mm. So I think, I mean, as to why we think it's interesting, I think it's partly about um, increasing global connectivity for Bitcoin so that more people can 
run a full node and participate in the network. So if you, if you're in you know an office like you are, Yammer, your internet connection is fast, and so you know running a full node is not a big deal. But for a lot of people, that's mm -hmm. either expensive or it, it uses up their internet connection. Um, so it's sort of under. I, I think people find it interesting that there's a possibility to transact without an internet connection because. Mm. You know, in, in Malta, it's not far from Egypt. And, you know, some years ago they had a revolution. And the first thing that the, you know, the people doing the coup did was they turned off the internet connection. Or I guess it was the people in power turned off the internet connection. After the coup succeeded, they turned it back on again. So, you know, if, if you had Bitcoin, if Bitcoin is supposed to be, you know, digital gold mm -hmm. to survive and have hard money in a time of economic crisis or instability, you want Bitcoin to work in this situation. And so, you know, satellite internet connectivity is a quite interesting prospect for Bitcoin. And there are ways to also, I mean, the satellite itself is sending you the bulk data, so it's receive, but there are ways to send data using the, using the satellite too. So we're continuing to build out mm -hmm. new features for it. Another, another kind of use case is just for businesses to have an extra connection. I think, you know, for, for mining pools and mining farms, it's, it's a good idea. And even for exchanges to have multiple internet connections mm -hmm. so that somebody can't, you know, send you wrong information. Like the, the Bitcoin chain is a bit vulnerable to forks. You know, so if, if you were, only seeing part of the data, you could think a transaction is completed, but actually it's been orphaned by a longer chain. So it's good to have a couple of different connections to be sure that you're on the longest chain. Mm -hmm. And the satellite is just, from that point of view, the satellite's another independent connection that has you know, basically no, no cost because, you know, once we broadcast it, it doesn't cost extra per user because it's sending the same data everywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, we started selling satellite kits now so you can buy uh, different equipment at different price points the cheapest way is to buy a software defined radio mm -hmm. and use a laptop that costs about a hundred dollars then there's a tbs device which costs about 250 and a and a pro device which is a nova s400 that costs about 750 and that one can listen to two different satellites simultaneously so you have two dishes two satellites and it's sending different data on, a, on the different satellites. Mm -hmm. So you, if you can listen to them both, you can get the blocks about twice as fast and you can sync history about twice as fast, so in about 10 days. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's some more room for optimization. So we're mm -hmm. continuing to improve the compression and uh, error correction efficiency and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of fun. I think people uh, enjoy the idea that the Bitcoin data is being uh, broadcast from space. It's, uh, you know, feels like science fiction is happening kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's a fun project. Yes. And actually, you know, since we started selling the kits, we were surprised at the number of pro kits that sold um, because they're, you know, three times as expensive. But uh, a surprising number of those being bought, like one guy bought five of them. That's like almost $4,000 of equipment in one purchase. So people like to <laughs> do things with this equipment. But it's also affordable. It's also, it's I think I mean other one. Well, this is this kid. <laughs> okay, I'll what? send you the link. <laughs> it also sounds I mean, affordable. It, it, yeah, it could be good for um. Yeah, and another use case we thought about is as a backup for a remote mining farm. I think with an internet connection, like um, a satellite uh, bidirectional internet connection, plus this receive only, you could. You could, as a backup, run a remote mining farm using it. So it, it could be interesting for that use case. It certainly, it doesn't have polar polar region uh, coverage. That's right. Yeah, that's the, it's the only problem because it's uh, geostationary. Uh, you, it, you can't see it from the poles. <laughs> nice. Almost everywhere else. Nice. And Shane is actually planning to do a mining farm in Antarctic. So. This solution might be very helpful for, for his mining from there. And uh, talking of, uh, how to say, um, in Malta, I think Chun was also um, mentioned it to me once, and he said 
he has a question about, for example, like why Adam like, moved to Malta and after so many years uh, living there, uh, how do you feel about it? And, and do you have any advice for people who might consider to move to Malta? Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, uh, it's easy to move to if you have a European passport. Of course, I'm about <laughs> to not have a European passport because of the Brexit. But, you know, there are still ways to, uh, to get a residence permit with any passport. And it's, um, it's kind of a low-tax jurisdiction for offshore companies, uh, internet gaming, films, tourism. So it's, it's, it's the most southern country in Europe. So it's quite warm. Mm -hmm. And almost everybody speaks English. Uh, cost of living is pretty reasonable. It's very safe. So I, I like it a lot. Where there's warm. And yeah, Sometimes. you see a lot of Europeans, European Bitcoiners uh, arriving and, and moving here because it's uh, there's no tax on uh, crypto trading. So you can you know you could sell some Bitcoin and not not be subject to tax. Mm -hmm. And so um, I I you know meet new Bitcoiners. They so say hello on the street and then they join the <laughs> local you know, Bitcoin meetup. Uh, so there's there's a lot of new people turning up all the time. Um, because it's, you know, if you're a European, a lot of the Northern European countries have quite high uh, income tax and capital mm -hmm. gains tax and so on. Nice. And I also know, like, you actually, uh, how to say, uh, runs your uh, your mining and blockstream mining and operations in North America. And uh, how how do uh, how's the business there? And what do you think of the China's changing role in the mining industry? Um, yeah, we have two farms, one in Montreal, Canada, on hydropower, and another one near Atlanta, Georgia, in the US. That one's bigger. Um, and, I mean, I think it's good for decentralization that there's hash rate in many countries, mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's not, you just, you just want, like, lots of countries so they can't agree, and they leave Bitcoin alone. So, you know, if, if there are dozens of countries all doing, you know, 5 to 10% of mining spread across many different companies and individuals. That's mm -hmm. great. Nobody can, uh, no individual can change anything. Of course, Bitcoin would probably survive if, if one country did try to change something because, you know, Bitcoin is activist investors and they, they adapt the technology. You saw that with the UASF, that Bitcoin is very anti-fragile. And the anti-fragility is like, users and investors and developers and miners and pools and so on. It's everybody, right? They, they like Bitcoin to be as it is. So if something threatens it, they fight back. So I think that's fine. Um, and it's good that, you know, more people are getting involved in mining. Mm -hmm. It could be interesting, you know, eventually maybe we'll see uh, sovereign wealth funds doing mining or even countries doing mining. Mm -hmm. um, who knows, you know? If, if you'd ask the question whether banks would be interested in Bitcoin, or you know, hedge fund people like uh, so. <laughs> the you know, the new the new people that get involved in Bitcoin, like um, Paul Tudor Jones, who apparently is quite a famous hedge fund guy, saying that he bought put one to two percent of his multi billion dollar fund into Bitcoin. So it sounded like there was a over a hundred million dollar. Uh, and he also, he also said he got record data, and if you say no, then you will find the wrong Bitcoin. <laughs> No, there was a joke. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, anyway, so I think it's... Uh, things ch things move faster in Bitcoin than people expect, you know? Like, yeah. when we started Blockstream in 2014, we didn't expect that any banks would be interested in Bitcoin or blockchain. And within a year or two, you know, every bank had a blockchain lab. Um, so, nice. you know, yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens in the next few years, but it's probably going to be faster and more interesting than we expect. Definitely. And you know, like Kevin, uh, he told me to tell you that if Blockstream one day plans to expand mining in China, he would love to be your reliable and trusted partner. <laughs> but anyway, okay. yeah. So uh, uh, actually, uh, for me, for me, if you know, Blockstream one day you want to like to settle up with some mining, I would like to be partner. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe you can uh, try the advanced configuration to to do uh, mining in a remote location. Yeah, I think there are satellite the mining is kind of very interesting. Anywhere you can see the sky, you can mine, right? 
Henny, you can mark. Yeah, yeah. Well, we should we should <laughs> talk offline. Uh, we have some ideas. This yeah. is the vision. Yeah. So, Chun, how do you think we can make mining safer and more decentralized? Uh, I also recently got a resident permit from Malta, and maybe uh, someday I can visit uh, Adam in person. And I also have planned to stay there for some extended time. So, to make uh, mining decentralized. Yeah, definitely, we, we, we must make mining decentralized. For now, like, uh, we have too much hash rate uh, uh, in, in China, a single country, and uh, um, sadly, um, you know, yeah. Uh, I think this recording probably must be broadcast uh, into China, so not a place to, to share share my share my view. So, yeah, uh, for... Yeah, we will we'll, we'll first uh, decentralize our team and uh, uh, second, uh, we'll decentralize you know, our operation. But uh, this is not, a, not the best place to, to explain in details. Okay, got it. <laughs> thank you, Chun. Uh, thanks. So uh, I think uh, Sue got a question also for Chun, something also related to this uh, um, kind of like the geography uh, issue. So maybe you, yeah. uh, Sue, maybe you may ask. Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, we're in an environment of rising nationalism in the US China conflict. Uh, you know, I, I've seen a lot more people nowadays in the US talk about how there needs to be Bitcoin mining that's happening in the US, happening on US soil, and, you know, from a strategic marketing point of view or, or just a national security point of view. You know, what are your thoughts on this kind of? rising nationalism and do you think it's do you think it has merit and how do you think it'll develop as you know geopolitical tension get you know, more and more tense yeah you mentioned that <laughs> yeah let me recall like a uh, large uh, human uh, by u.s rockets from u.s soil uh things like this it's gonna happen within the next few days right so to me, that like, statement like this is quite narrow-minded, and uh, also I feel national uh, nationalism, the, the Bitcoin Cash uh, uh, maximalist, they, they share a lot of uh, similarities. You know, <laughs> sorry about Bitcoin Cash followers. So, yeah, um, yeah I. Um, I, I um, before before I, I got to got into crypto and Bitcoin, I spent uh, quite a lot of time uh, working on Wikipedia, contribute to Wikipedia. What I uh, influenced the most from Wikipedia is like a uh, neutral point of view, and uh, that's uh, basically share a lot of similarity to uh, decentralization. So when you see anything or some uh, any 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 problem in the world, try to see it from a neutral way. And uh, try to see it from a God point of view. And uh, this day, people are also talking about the uh, internet neutri uh, uh, neutrality. So, um, it, mm, if, if you combine all these concepts, they, they all talk talking about the same thing. Uh, and uh, potentially, I feel the, mm, the blockchain and uh, Bitcoin is and so is. It's, it's, it must be uh, have a, a neutrality uh, uh, from a single entity, uh, any single country. Because because if you look into the future, um, uh, our current system and the, the history not not that long, and uh, people only gave up from using gold and silver those those fine metals uh, until like uh, one hundred years ago. Uh, because uh, you know the industry, uh, industrial revolution has changed a lot of things. It makes the uh, global economy to to grow sharply. Mm. That make uh, uh, gold and silver this kind of is no longer uh, feasible to become uh, like a global currency. Uh, before the invention of uh, Bitcoin, there's no such thing to replace gold and silver. And Bitcoin makes this, uh, uh, give the freedom, uh, the economic freedom, back to. Uh, make it possible again after gold and the silver get retired. And uh, countries like um, China, I mean, the PRC and the United States of America, the history is also quite short. 
So if you look into future, in, uh, I bet after maybe 12, 300 years, this world won't have a PRC and they won't have a USA. So, um, and uh, we see people like we have white people, we have black people, we have Asian. That's because uh, in the past, uh, the technology, the transport technology, the communication technology is not that developed. And, uh, but uh, things already changed. Uh, um, so it probably won't be a, hun a few hundred years, but I think at most a few thousand years, there won't be white people, black people, and Asian. There are only all the humans would be united in one. Probably we will see Earth, Earth people and the Mars people, and uh, basically that's it. So it, it makes no sense to like people to, to fighting with each other. And uh, we, if you think this way, we do need a global currency. We do need a global, uh, after you, you, you uh, uh, to my understanding, Bitcoin is not just, it's just the beginning. Uh, first, it be apply decentralization, this philosophy to economy. And then after it gets the seeds uh, in economy, the next thing could be uh, political. And uh, mm, you see, uh, right now, every country will have a president. And what the president do is just a delay, declare a pandemic. What, what's the use of a president? Um, um. <laughs> uh, before, uh, you know, in the history, we, we need a president because uh, the communication skill, uh, technology is quite back forward. We need to delegate our everyday decision making to a president or king. And uh, since, uh, you know, we have internet and we can make decision, the mass population could make every single tiny decision and the cost is so low and we don't need to delegate this decision making to uh, someone else. So I think maybe we don't need a president anymore. And uh, if we don't need that, maybe something decentralized, decentralized governance should be replaced, uh, should, 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 yeah, should be the, the, the future. Okay. This, uh, thank you, Chu. And uh, since we talk about nation, I think uh, Sue and I were also we had some discussion about the crypto in Latin America. Um, so, so you maybe you can share maybe our discussion question uh, to Beto because Latin America definitely is very different. For example, from China, from the US, uh, from Europe. Yeah, I I guess my question would be um, you know, just talking about stable coins versus Bitcoin and how you see adoption going there in terms of um, you know now now that we're past the having the the fees are you know sometimes a hundred sat per byte, sometimes higher, so you end up with two, three, four dollars. Do you, do you see people tend to, uh, it, are the fees on the on the base layer an issue at this point for LATAM adoption? And do you see sort of base stable coins uh, growing in traction? I mean, obviously we, we see a lot of stable coin activity on, on Ethereum happening right now uh, on USDT. And uh, you know, how are you seeing that in LATAM? Yes, um, it's a really good question. Um, well, there is a lot of usage right now. People are fleeing uh, into crypto. In Argentina, mostly, we have uh, last Friday, we entered into a credit default as a country. So even if they continue negotiating about the credit, and uh, we might enter into embargoes uh, from payments that come into Argentina uh, through the US, you know, the, the local central bank has an account in New York in the bank and they can freeze that, uh, the guys that want to get the money. So it happened before. We have a lot of practice with that. <laughs> and um, people are saying, okay, what's safe? Because uh, the local currency is not safe. Mm -hmm. And what's safe for us uh, as an Argentinian? Well, the USD. But the USD is... Uh, forbidden to be traded here. So Bitcoin is not. So in the last uh, few weeks, we had uh, 5x growth in the exchanges, uh, getting into uh, stable coins and Bitcoin. So it's really interesting because people are flying into uh, <laughs> crypto uh, uh, here. 
And this is what I've been seeing in, in the past uh, few months. So I, I've been consulting uh, some provinces, municipalities here, local governments uh, that want to use crypto. And they're pretty interested because uh, it is a means for them to protect their money. And I'm telling you that that's government people. Mm-hmm. I, I have mayors, I have uh, governors mm-hmm. which want to protect the money in crypto. So what we are doing now is trying to give them the solutions for that because there's not so many tools for that. So that's why I started this new project, which is Bidham, Um to be able to give them infrastructure and tools uh, for governments to be able to operate in the the crypto infrastructure. And uh, we're not there yet. You know, there's a lot to go because we need, uh, as you say, we have problems with the fees. So the only uh, transactions that are really useful right now are the consolidated ones. So you need to have uh, a good amount of money. So that's why we focus in government business and business to business and um, what the governments want is to be able to also to have tokens to be able to trade so you have everything inside the same crypto infrastructure mm-hmm. not trading with bitcoin on a daily basis to go to buy a coffee because that's uh, as fees are are not good for that mm-hmm. but maybe with the lightning network but we're we're still um not there yet on the technology side. So there is a lot to build, uh, but there is interest. Uh, there, there is a lot of interest right now here. And I think that um, we will be, we'll be getting there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same uh, model, I think, that happened with communications, with uh, Skype and uh, versus local telecoms uh, is happening here. So for example, I have one province that wants the bank to be able to give that infrastructure in crypto. Mm. So now we're talking government banks wanting to use this infrastructure. And uh, I think it's really, really exciting. And it has to do a lot with the COVID. It has to do with the acceleration of times because of of these tragedies. And as you say before, um, nationalism, problems that are arising in the world, geopolitical problems, Bitcoin can solve all of them, many, many things that it can solve. So it's really, really exciting. I, I am so, so excited about this. Uh, but I, I'm also aware that we have to work a lot. Mm-hmm. There is a lot to go yet. And we, we're just starting to see it. Mm-hmm. Building infrastructure is never easy. And, and Beto, what are the main staple coins there? Like uh, USDT or... or- or yeah, people use a lot USDT, USDC, DAI, uh, USDC less actually, mm-hmm. but uh, DAI, I think um, USDT are the main uh, uses uh, for stable coins right now. As many people in China are actually talking about USDT collapse or whatever, some conspiracy, I would also like to know what do you think of USDT there? Oh, I think that USDT has shown something about stable coins, that it's not all about collateral. It's about usage. It's about what it solves for you to use this technology. Mm. So the price is not only in the collateral, it's also if it is useful for you. Mm. And uh, I think that the, that is what you call uh, at one point trust for the layman. The layman only wants to have some solution for the problem. So if USDT is a solution, they use it, but they don't hold into it. And that's what I always tell people. If you want to do an investment, go into Bitcoin on the long run, never on the short run. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if you want to uh, use it to uh, pay something or to do something that you're used to in USD denomination, yeah, you can use USDT, USDC, or any of the other, uh, well, uh, true USD, people are using a lot true USD as well. And you have all those solutions and you can use them and hedge into crypto uh, one way or another. You, you have uh, all these possibilities. Mm-hmm. I think Sue knows, like uh, being an active trader, definitely like USDT and BTC are probably the most uh, 
how to say, uh, why did you use uh, uh, coins? Right. So, um, yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, I also, since you mentioned use case uh, for the Bitcoin, and I know Adam and Beto, uh, I know you both share the view that how important is the payment use case uh, in the Bitcoin, uh, since it's a purely peer-to-peer uh, -peer version of electronic cash uh, that allows online payments to be sent directly from one part to another uh, without going through any um, financial institution. Uh, would you like to go a, a bit deeper into this topic and share insights with us, Beto and, and Adam? Yeah, I mean, the the fees are an interesting problem, and it's, uh, of course, people are starting to pay attention now, um, because the fees are up, and actually they're, they're lower this weekend. I did one this morning for 2.2 sats per V-byte that got into the next block in a few minutes, but into last week, you're probably into 50 to 100, if not more. Um, was get a, a dip at the weekend, but I, th I think what what people are thinking is that the fees are largely driven by traders, and it's because the uh, traders are price insensitive because they're already paying a lot more. So they're paying you know thirty or forty dollars wire transfer fee. They're paying twenty basis points, like zero point two percent or more commission for a taker on the exchange, and so. If they have to pay ten cents or a dollar instead of ten cents, they don't care. I mean, maybe they'll pay two two dollars just just to be safe because they want their trade to happen quickly. They don't want the price to move. And uh, unfortunately, a, the fee market is like uh, there's a lot of trading bots, and they're not that clever. So they're they're like a room full of turkeys. If you've seen this phenomena, somebody says boo, and all the turkeys go blah blah blah, blah and make a lot of noise. So you know, as soon as a trader comes in and he pays 10 satoshis, the next trader pays 20, 30, 40, 50, you know, within a very short period of time, the fees are super high. And it's not really, you know, strictly necessary. They're just software automatically paying more. Um, but in any case, that creates a problem for people trying to do uh, actual use. And it, it's ironic because the the traders think that Bitcoin is great and the use cases are great for censorship-resistant money, permissionless money, and so forth. So they want to buy some of it and they push the fees up and make it harder to use, which is you know where the value in the use cases. So you know I think the solution is is not simple, but we have um, multiple layers. Most most networks are organized with layers. You know, like TCP/IP is like that. Cell phone networks are like that, satellite communications are like that, even Bluetooth is like that. There are different layers of the communication stack. So with Bitcoin now, there are more layers than there used to be. A lot of people are familiar with Lightning, and that's, you know, it's got a lot easier to use. There are a lot, a lot more wallets now. It's more reliable. It's a lot cheaper, and it's also just faster. So, you know, even, even apart from the cost, Lightning transactions are final in a fraction of a second and a bitcoin transaction is not really you know it could be undone you know tens of minutes later so for a really point of sale use case or immediate purchase online lightning is just better because everything that in layer two is making a trade-off mm. if if it was possible to do do something better bitcoin would already have done it right so you're usually giving something up for this advantage so lightning has a a more reactive security model, hot wallet, so it's not as secure. But for smaller payments, it's definitely faster and cheaper and more scalable. And then, you know, what, what Blockstream has been working on is a different layer two called Liquid, which is for traders, basically. People who are bidding the price up, it would be better for everybody if uh, they would use a trading layer two. And it has advantages for them. It's it's faster and it's confidential, so you don't get the kind of front-running risk of seeing a transaction on the whale alerts. And it supports multiple assets. So it supports Teva and Canadian dollars and Bitcoin and security tokens and what have you. So, and the fees are a lot cheaper. So even, even with the confidential transactions, the typical transactional liquid that will be final in two minutes is like one or two cents. And with the transaction fees during the week on Bitcoin, that's you know it gets a lot more expensive. And um, so I think ultimately, 
you know, the sort of positive competition between the different the different layers of Bitcoin between the main chain, which is which is the best for cold storage and censorship resistant payments, and Lightning, which is the best for retail payments and market payments, mm -hmm. and Liquid, which is the best for traders and um, people doing exchange trading or moving money between you know moving coins between exchanges or between exchanges and cold wallets. Then that, that's a better option for them. So if people use the best trade-off for that use case, it just makes you know, the main chain uh, more scalable and supports more use cases. Um, so I think that's, that's presumably the way things will evolve and presumably in, you know, I would expect in the, in the future we'll see more layer twos optimize for different things as well. Since uh, you mentioned this uh, uh, trader... Uh, may, may I add something? Uh, for, for me, like uh, the um, the theory, the current theory about the the, the right number, and uh, maybe it could be a little bit higher, and because the fee, uh, it's a directly uh, measure to the uh, security of the network. Uh, without the fee, without uh, if every every new block is generated, the backlog backlog cleared, then the network won't be the network won't be safe, won't be secured, and. Uh, Given the block reward get half and half and half, and then uh, the fees become more and more important. Higher. And uh, uh, given that before, like between it got stolen by uh, one hundred twenty thousand bitcoins, uh, it's like uh, uh, someone uh, someone paid a very high fee transaction. Like uh, get stolen is basically very similar to like uh, pay the fee to the network and. Uh, uh, some miners, if uh, like uh, either get contracted with between to to mine to roll back the network, to roll back the network, you gonna have to take a risk. Like you have to compete with all other miners. Like uh, it's like if a current block reward is uh, ten BTC, uh, each bit each uh, each new block you lose ten BTC. Then if you have uh, uh, if you want to roll back. Uh, uh, 100,000 uh, BTC worth of uh, transaction, then the, the the risk ratio is like one to uh, 1,000. Then it, even given you have uh, 0 0.1 percent of profit, it's worth to 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 make a bet. And uh, so we must uh, make sure this uh, what was the worst case uh, someone got stolen. Uh, if, like, say, the worst case, uh, someone could get got stolen uh, one hundred thousand BTC, then we must uh, to ensure that uh, the fee plus block reward uh, won't be lower than some uh, specific number, and uh, the number uh, you know uh, higher than 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 the well, the, those my bad manners who willing to roll back the net, network Evil to manner. to make the network safe. Maybe Adam uh, could could tell us. Right. No, I mean it's it is a concern, uh, particularly yes. in, in the future where the uh, reward is lower. And I think the most recent like exchange hack where people even discussed. You know, I mean, nobody took it seriously, but there were people talking about it, right, is Binance got hacked for $40 million of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and they were talking to people and asking if they could roll back, and of course it didn't happen, but that's not that's not a good thing for Bitcoin. You, you know, Bitcoin should be bearer and final. Um, I think there might be ways to to make it more final, with additional, I mean, so if you think about it, one one reason that that became final is because they were too slow. You know, by the time they were talking about it, an hour had passed. You know, by the time more yeah. people were talking about it, a day had passed, and now they're not just like undoing a mistake, but like if you if you undid all of that, it would be a disaster. I mean, you know, people would double spend it, exchanges would have an accounting mess. The whole of Bitcoin exchange, the whole Bitcoin exchange world would be like Mt. Gox, years of accounting arguments, right? So I think it's not really 
it's extremely messy, so we don't want it to happen. I think there might be some like uh, technical solutions, like we could make miners that refuse to go backwards, let's say. Um, so the individual miner normally is expecting the block height to increase. Because even, even with the reorg from its perspective, it only changes if it sees a longer block. It never changes to a shorter block height. So we could make miners with a firmware that says you know, forwards only and refuses to go backwards. That would be another way to harden it because now, you know, what are you going to do? If somebody wants to roll back the block, okay, what do they propose we do? Like uh, take the top off the miner and change it? We haven't got time to do that, right? So it's not built like that now, but it could be. And maybe it should be. Um, so the only way to maintain the block, uh, the Bitcoin network safe and secure is uh, maintain the relative, relatively high fee rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, so you were talking about something a minute ago, which was the sort of uh, less less politics, more sort of uh, open global consensus. So I thought there was an interesting quote from somebody called David Clark, which is in uh, Internet Protocol History. So this is... Uh, I, w I wasn't really paying attention, though I was using the internet back then, but there was a, a big protocol debate in the IETF in the early 90s where the big companies that got involved, like you know, Microsoft and Intel and different people who were making equipment, some of them thought that they should, be, they should have the right to change the, the internet protocols because they were companies. And the people developing the protocols thought that the internet should be built for the users you know, like the Tron quote, I fight for the users, say. Anyway, there's a big political debate, and uh, somebody called Alex Bergeron wrote a uh, blog post called The Tower of uh, Bitcoin Development. And he has the quote from this ITF argument by David Clark, who was at ITF, uh, some, somehow involved with the ITF, and he says, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. So I thought it was great, because it's kind of, you know, Bitcoin... The Bitcoin folk drama was kind of relearning the same uh, story almost, right? Which is, you know, Bitcoin should be for the users. And I, th I like to think that Bitcoin would, would help, like Wang Shun was saying, about the, uh, you know, changing geopolitics and governments, say, reducing the need for government. Um, I, I've read the book called Snow Crash many years ago, and it's it's all about a future where the government kind of exists, but nobody cares or pays any attention to it because it's tiny and ignored. Mm -hmm. So I think that government's relevance and influence in the world shrinks over time like because people have more direct control of their affairs and they can travel more easily and they can communicate more easily. So... I've got to think that the world is, you know, the governments have less influence in some ways today than like 50 years ago, and maybe in another 50 years, they'll be even less relevant. At least I hope so. So that's, that's my hope for Bitcoin to just make individuals more sovereign and make governments less relevant. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a really interesting statistic by uh, one of the big um, international finance sort of intra-government things that I think something like 50% of the world's working population is, is like self-employed gray market. Like they're working for cash in a, in a country where there's no identity documents or they're just working in a gray market. So if, if really that much of the world's working population is, is working for cash and mobile, they're, they're a prime candidate for using Bitcoin and, you know, for them, then the government is less relevant. Mm -hmm. so I, I like this trend. I want to see more of it. What, what are your thoughts, Beto? Um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, like Adam, in that sense, uh, it's pretty interesting how Bitcoin has brought a new model for people that are uh, already uh, living on cash. Here in Argentina, we have that uh, that view. Uh, people uh, are unbanked a lot or underbanked. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we suffered lots and lots of uh, economic experiments. So Bitcoin was a an interesting one to suffer as well. <laughs> and I say suffer because uh, you have to deal with it. You have to learn a lot on how to use it and uh, what is best. And uh, you adapt. So as long as there are more tools for using it, it will be easier for people. But uh, at, at the, I don't know, five years ago, only Techies could really use it. Today, uh, it's easier, you have more tools, but then again, for example, with Lightning, you still have to be a techie, and uh, that there are still many problems that have to be solved. So we'll see with time and how payments evolve, in that sense, mm -hmm. how, how can people actually use uh, this uh, networks, and how also the, the other tokens and the other blockchains are uh, showing some sometimes uh, use cases that then you can um, get into Bitcoin later when, when Bitcoin is uh, ready for that. I think that, that there are many things that Bitcoin needs to be slower because it needs to be safer. Mm -hmm. And other networks, other blockchains are able to go faster mm -hmm. and show how to do some things and then uh, Bitcoin can get them. And I think that's why so many tokens are now in the air. It's not only because of trading, but also because uh, there are different use cases. Uh, I think with all these CBDCs and uh, governments trying to enter the token world, uh, we have a very, very interesting, uh, like, middle ground where we can get people more into Bitcoin and into this, not needing so much the government. And I think that many governments actually want that, actually need to have less problems, less, uh, because I believe in Bitcoin, it's very uh, similar to cash. To, to the banknote, you know, you have the banknote in your hand and you're safe. You know you have the cash. And with Bitcoin is the same. You have it. It is not in a bank account. It's not uh, on someone else's uh, custody. And I think that that's the, the main thing that we need to go from cash into Bitcoin or into this uh, token world where people can be the their own bank, they actually have everything that they need to transact. And um, the world is going that way. It will take some time for us to be able to build all the, the tools. But I think that uh, in 50 years, uh, this would be like, yeah, it's obvious. <laughs> you know, why would you use a piece of paper uh, if you have uh, Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. And I think that we are going that way, but it will take some time. Thank you, Beto. Since Adam was uh, earlier mentioning like being a trader, transaction fee, I would like to know, Sue, you are being an active, uh, experienced trader. I mean, definitely transaction fee matters a lot. Uh, do you have any comment on the, the previous uh, the talk about the transaction fee, the high fee, and how that's going to impact maybe your, your trading? I think it doesn't impact traders as much as... Um, users, as Adam was kind of alluding to, which is mainly the fact that the exchange fees on an exchange, you're still already going to pay, you know, three or four basis points you know, just to do a trade. So then, you know, if you're trading to decent size and you're moving capital around to rebalance your portfolio, mm -hmm. you know, you're you're happy paying whatever fee it takes to get into the next block uh, quite often. So, you know, I think we did some transactions that we paid just 200 cent per buy where we just, uh, we, we, you know, we need those coins to arrive very quickly, that, um, especially when you're trying to move platter around. So I think in a way that that's, you know, it would be nice to see that go toward liquid. I mean, I think that the main problem has been that a lot of exchanges don't support it yet. So it's just, a, it's a process, right? It's a, it's a matter of like, I think one, I guess is politics, but then two is just like getting everyone on board with it. Um, but, um, you know, my fear is that that does crowd out real users. You know? Like you know, if someone just, just got to explain what Bitcoin is and then they go and they try it and they pay like, you know, 20% of their balance out in, in transaction fees, you know, it's not a great, you know, first experience. Um, and, 
I do fear that, uh, you know, because, you know, the these fees are not even in, like, the beginning of the phase, right? Like, if we get into a real bull market, I can easily see, like, 1,000 cents per bite, like, three days, uh, these kinds of fees. So, so I, I do hope that uh, we have solutions for down the line in the long run. And, and I think we will. But um, so I guess, like, for traders, you know, whatever the price is, it'll just be priced into the value of the trades, right? So people will take that into, into account. But it's where the trading can, in a way, crowd out the using of it on chain. That that kind of concerns me. Thank you all. Thank you for your sharing. So now moving on to our final discussion tonight. So in China, our government has been promoting this new infrastructure idea, where they officially include blockchain as one of the new uh, infrastructures this year, together with 5G, IoT, AI, big data, and others. So how Bitcoin and blockchain will look like in the next five or ten years, from your perspective? Uh, probably let's start with Chun. Go for me. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah. Adam first. <laughs> <laughs> how how is blockchain going to look in the next five years? Yes. So yes, I have some imagination. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, R and D going on, sort of innovation. So I think there's, you know. We look backwards always and assume the future will look like the past, but the technology is evolving very quickly and the adoption and use cases are moving faster than we expect. You know, each, each time in the past, if somebody would have asked you, you know, when the price was $100, is it possible to have 10000 People would have said, you're crazy, right? And here we are today. Or would you expect banks to, you know, be participating in conferences and running blockchain labs, and like, no, no, that would never happen, and so on. So it, all these things happen and happen faster. So I think we can expect more of the same. And on technology, um, <coughs> on on the technology front, there's there's a lot of R and D happening all the time. So I think you know, for example, people are not so familiar with it, but there's a, a new smart contracting language which is designed for Bitcoin called Simplicity. And so this was first proposed in 2012 in IRC discussions. And so we hired the person who was proposing this, Russell O'Connor, and he's been working on it for about four years with, and most recently with Andrew Postra and Greg Maxwell at Bill. So, um, so it's, it's a way to have uh, security first, security guarantees, and uh, formal proofs about security and behavior for uh, Bitcoin and Liquid. So we released um, a branch of Bitcoin with Simplicity integrated and a branch of Elements, which is the open source part, you know, platform that Liquid is built on. So we're hoping to have that available in Liquid late, late this year. And, you know, one of the advantages of sidechains is that people can try things in advance and, and see that they work and improve them. So, you know, in 2015, there was Schnorr signatures in, in Elements, the part of Liquid. And this year, you know, there's a BIP and Schnorr signatures look to be coming to Bitcoin maybe this year, maybe next year, depending on how quickly that gets, you know, finished review and activated. So, so you can see that you know things that can appear in a sidechain can maybe find their way into Bitcoin like two to four years later. Um, so hopefully things like simplicity and confidential transactions will also make their way into Bitcoin. And simplicity changes things a lot because it's a general extension mechanism for Bitcoin. So for example, if Bitcoin had simplicity today, then you wouldn't need a soft fork for Schnorr signatures or for uh, the SIG hash no input, which is a feature for Taproot, sorry, a feature for, for Lightning L2. All those things would be sort of self extensible. You could implement them using simplicity directly in the, in the chain in a, in, a, in a surprisingly compact and efficient way. So that self extensibility is good because it lets you build more things and move faster, but still with security guarantees. And it means you have to change the chain less. So I think, you know, people like the idea of Bitcoin being sort of final and not undergoing rapid change. Um, so sort of, the phrase ossify in a positive way, right? That you want to be able to depend on 
the base layer and not see rapid changes in it in the, in the long term. So simplicity is a is a route to doing that because you know I think you know actually there's there's a quote from Satoshi on a forum somewhere where he says something like he he wanted to get scripting done so that there wouldn't need to be changes in Bitcoin. So that didn't actually work out because the scripting was a bit simplified and some of it ended up getting disabled because of security bugs. But I think the idea was great that, you know, if, if Bitcoin is made self-extensible, then we can you know, add new features. So, you know, somebody who's working on Lightning could try different ways to do Lightning more efficiently. So, yeah, I think a lot more innovation, probably some more layer twos, more usability, more price. So, you know, I think the next four years will be very interesting with uh, Plan B's stock to flow predictions he, he's predicting you know 100,000 or 300,000 dollar bitcoin so we'll see we'll see if we see that that would be very nice obviously but you know when you see people like Paul Tudor Jones uh, turning up and buying 100 million dollars or something like that OTC mm. you know people pay attention to that who are from the investment world because it's somebody from their world who speaks their language and, you know, understands their interests. So, and also the, um, you know, the economic condition right now is, uh, is a kind of, Concerning. you know, it's, 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 a, it's bad for the economy generally, but the amount of money printing that's going on mm. and the, um, the fact that people have difficulty knowing what to invest in is is a, is a problem for them, right? You know, they, they could invest in the stock market, but they don't know if it's bonds. Normally, they might invest in real estate, but maybe real estate in big cities is overpriced if people are going to work more remotely now. Um, and interest rates are like zero or negative. Um, governments are printing money like crazy. So nobody knows what to invest in. So... It, it makes an interesting time for Bitcoin and gold. And that's, that's basically what Paul Tudor Jones said and what other investors like, from the conventional investment world have said about Bitcoin. So there's a lot to, a lot to look at in uh, financial terms as well as technology terms in the next you know, five years. Thank you, Adam. So like living in Argentina, I think Beto has probably like more to, to imagine or to, to, how to, say, to, to share with us. How do you think the Bitcoin in the next five well, years? Um, I think that what China is doing is pretty interesting on how they are ambitioning uh, the, the connection with the other technologies and how blockchain start playing. Obviously, they, they are afraid that the government, uh, as in many parts of the world, yeah. are afraid of uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So if they, they want to separate uh, something that you can't separate. Uh, so it's pretty interesting on how that will evolve. And um, for example, I, I used many use cases um, for international payments because it was really uh, something that you could solve with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. it, it is the, the main use case uh, for problems that arise in payments. And um, I think that China right now is understanding that, is understanding that they can use this technology to push uh, the, the international payments uh, case. But they still don't know really how. They, they are still struggling on, on how to do it. And uh, being able to connect to uh, different blockchains, I think that that's something that's a start point. Uh, for them to be able to use it uh, with countries like here in Latin America. And as I was telling you, we have problems with uh, credit default, so we won't sure. be able to have uh, money from other places. And uh, this makes a new infrastructure for countries to invest in other countries and be able to get the money back and not being embargoed by some middle country. So I, I see it that way. I see it that uh, the infrastructure of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain will start gaining weight on many countries. And here in Argentina, I really hope and uh, I'm working on that 
to be able to have uh, solutions for the people to be able to live better, to, to have better uh, tools uh, at the disposal to protect their money and also to be able to trade with other countries. So it's really interesting, but it takes uh, time uh, to, to see it go through and also to make the people with uh, decision on the governments to understand how this uh, will help them also to, to provide a better living for uh, the citizens. So well, uh, I think that's, uh, that's it. Thank you, Beto. And how about you, Chen? Yeah, so I think Adam already explained the question details. I, I still remember that when I uh, first started mining Bitcoin, I tried to like probably survive for two months at, uh, at least. So I, because from my calculation, uh, then the difficulty and uh, uh, my hash rate, I can recover my investment within two months. And uh, sadly, I didn't expect the difficulty went up <laughs> so rapidly. So I didn't recover my investment after two years. Uh, I only recovered my, my investment after two years. So, um, you know, it, it's so hard to make a prediction. But uh, what I know right now is uh, it can't will survive after five or ten years. Definitely will, it will survive. It is something um, uh, if, if, you know, uh, for us, like for me, it's uh, I also invest a lot in the LTCON, but uh, uh, after checking all these LTCONs, uh, including Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, all this, I want to say Bitcoin is the most uh, promise uh, because, uh, because why? It's, uh, the reason is Satoshi. Satoshi is uh, you check all other coins, Cosmos, Ethereum, no one comparable. So Bitcoin is, is only uh, fully decentralized and uh, uh, the global currency belong to the humanity. Thank you, Chen. And you, sir? I, I think this, this whole decade will be very important for Bitcoin on the main stage um, as it becomes a sort of some macro convergence where macro investors consider it alongside gold, where individuals consider it as a as a saving technology. I think for the other blockchains, I do think that there will be a separation where uh, it'll become increasingly clear that money tends to want to go toward one. It's a sort of a social coordination game. So you, you don't generally have a lot of... I don't imagine that there will a lot be a lot of different altcoins or coins competing for monetary premium in general, but I but I do think that there, there there are use cases on some other blockchains. I think Ethereum has some use cases that are already quite powerful. I think um, some of the interop stuff like Cosmos and Polkadot I think are also interesting uh, in terms of um, as decentralized experiments as well as uh, governance experiments. I, I think it's very hard to predict, right? Because you know, when the Ethereum ICO came out, uh, you know, not a lot of people bought it uh, and made that thousand, three thousand x. So, but nowadays, like everyone has a lot of opinions on. It. So, it's the kind of thing where, um, you know, ultimately, it'll. It, people always underestimate the 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 virality involved in crypto. Where if there are some interesting use cases that solve people's problems, that that are really um, powerful, I think. Um, the adoption waves can be much bigger this time because there's no more regulatory hurdles like there were before. There's no more sort of stigma, right? There, there, there's no more social stigma around it. People will just consider it alongside something else. You know, if we have, you know, decentralized uh, applications that um, are better than our existing uh, centralized walled garden applications, I do think people will want to use them and try them out, especially the younger generation. And I think that ultimately... I would say Bitcoin definitely for monetary maximalism, and I think the other blockchains, you know, it's still too early to tell, but um, there's a lot of exciting stuff that people are trying to do, and I do hope they get there. So. 
And thank you, Sue. Sue, I love your recent tweet about uh, people will buy the Bitcoin dip at uh, 20,300 within a year. Hopefully, this will be one of the good news uh, for this special year of 2020. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. And really, thank you guys for being here tonight. And thank you very much for all your great work to push to push this Bitcoin moving forward. And I hope the show as a bit of... Um, fun to your lockdown life and remember to sing uh, happy bitcoin while washing your hands for 20 seconds originally it was to sing happy birthday and i recently discovered actually sing happy bitcoin sounds also nice happy bitcoin to you it sounds actually quite nice <laughs> so uh thank you again so good night from beijing guys thanks <laughs>